Welcome back, everybody. This is Brother Meehan. Today we are now finally in official version 1.015 release of Celeste, Crown of the Magister. This is actually an official game for everybody now. You can totally play the game. You don't have to do early access. There's still bugs that I expect, hence the version. Uh, but uh, I'm planning a new playthrough. So again, we've deleted our main characters because I want to show you how we actually generate those characters. Um, we're going to do the same four, uh, and we're going to do the same playthrough that we did before, obviously farther. So this is official. This will be the start of a new the Let's Play series. Um, let's talk about a new adventure. We're selecting a character. We want to generate a new character. Uh, let's talk about the different types of uh, characters we can make. So we have the different lineages of uh, dwarves. So, so we have Hill Dwarf versus Snow Dwarf. We have Half Elves, which are just generic. Humans, generic. High Elves versus Sylvan Elves. Marsh Halflings versus Island Halflings. And that's all we have access to currently. Modders may extend this, give us some, some orcs maybe, or half orcs would be fucking awesome. But by and large, this is all you really need to have a good D&D &D type of adventure. Now, for the main character, we're going to go human and we're going to go male. This is going to be Brother Mutant, and I'll show you what we're going to make with him. He is going to be a straight-up wizard. Notice our classes are currently limited to cleric, fighter, paladin, ranger, rogue, and wizard. Subclasses in all of them, or at the very least, uh, domains for clerics, for example, or in paladin's case, they have specific... Um, uh, oath that they'll uh, unlock different types of fighters too uh, we're going to have a, a spell sword literally someone that at level 3 can cast four of the eight different schools of wizard spells and same with the rogue they'll be a shadow caster at level 3 which again will unlock the other four spell list uh, or schools of spells from the wizard list so again between the spell sword uh, that we have for the fighter and the the shadow caster that we have from the rogue they'll actually have access to many of the wizard spells that a wizard will have access to so then the point becomes well why play a wizard because i want to for one and then b uh, the wizard will have access to those spells infinitely faster and have access to more spells a day so these guys are just for funsies i like playing my subcasters if you guys ever watch my pathfinder kingmaker videos you know why uh same reason for why we're going for a paladin for our healer instead of a cleric who'll be awesome uh, I want a subcaster, so a paladin, someone that can still fight, can still you know wreak some unholy damage, pardon the pun, and it's literally uh, heal the team up sporadically. So again, we have to be very careful with a team like this. We're not going to be playing hearts difficulty or anything crazy like that. So again, this is going to be a relatively normal playthrough. Notice the arcane traditions for wizards; they show you stuff that you have access to. So the shock Harkness will be the type of wizard we pick, and that's at level two. Uh, they could have picked a Lord Master or a Green Mage, and a Green Mage could have been useful because you see the spells that they have access to, for example, Animal Friendship, Detect Poison and Disease, Entangle, Fairy Fire, Good Berry for some nice food slash healing, Hunter's Mark, Long Strider, Bark Skin, Pass Without Trace, Lesser Restoration, etc. and so forth. Basically, a lot of druid isk type spells, uh, hence the Green Mage idea. Uh, again, they would honestly feel like a, like a blaster druid if you would, with this type of setup. Lord Master just basically gets uh, some extra bonuses for their Arcana stuff, extra spells a day, etc. and so forth. So, powerful, don't kid yourself, all of these are good choices, but the Shock Arcanist uh, gets some really good bonuses to their spells. They can be upcast, if you will. Uh, a spell, for example, like uh, Magic Missile at level uh, 2 for a normal uh, wizard would be like... a uh, three or four magic missiles and that's all they get well because this one's being cast at one slot level higher so it's being cast as a level two spell technically speaking for free no less um it literally gets an extra arrow that's the best way to explain this the other ones would be more damage dice same general principle they'll do more whatever more is and, and in most cases since we're talking invocation spells we're talking more damage they get uh, extra bonuses uh, you add your proficiency bonus and your intelligence bonus to your evocation spell damage for one minute. Obviously, that uh, recharges that only after a long rest. Uh, Arcane Shock, you overcharge your mana and become rest uh, restrained until the end of your turn. Uh, however, you can cast an attack spell. Your damage dice are always above average. In return, you make a con saving throw DC 14 and take 2d6 second damage if you fail. What this sounds like is to me that you're um, putting more effort if you will, into your spell, like more of your soul, if you will. And as such, failure you know, results in bad things happening to you. So, again, this is something that we see in D&D, uh, &D, and I think even Pathfinders added that to the second uh, edition iteration, where evokers can literally force extra magic, and as a, uh, such, they'll take extra damage to themselves in, in compensation for doing that. And you may say, 
why would you ever want to hurt yourself? Well, if it's a choice of hurting myself versus dying from the horde that's coming down on my face, yeah, I'll happily take a little bit of damage to kill all them motherfuckers out. So you can see what this is basically jiving to. But Shock Arcanist will be the, the type that I'm going for eventually. Notice, um, uh, our saving throw proficiencies for being a wizard is intelligence and wisdom, so obviously you'd want to have uh, one or both of those stats to be pretty high because you get a... a, a proficiency in those saving throws you might not make them better um our, our weapon proficiency is extremely limited it's okay because we're not planning on meleeing for shit uh with light crossbow would actually probably serve us well for a ranged weapon uh having said that we have uh, infinite use cantrips in this game and i'll probably just get a couple of damaging ones that's not to say we're not going to have bad guys that can't fuck with us because they're immune to like fire or cold damage for example uh but light crossbows would be our backup in, in that regard uh, notice that we get uh, wizard skills. We get two skills from Arcana his uh, to pick from. Uh, Arcana history, is insight, investigation, medicine, and religion, and that's a laundry list of things to pick from. And you may think, well, Arcana is kind of a no-brainer, and probably like in, uh, in insight or religion or medicine. Again, something that would make sense. But again, remember we're basing this stuff off intelligence, and if it's not an intelligence-based stat, it's probably not something I give a damn about. Notice that we can cast spells from our wizard list, obviously. Uh, ritual casting, this is going to be extremely important for the spells that we pick. We'll explain that when we pick spells. Uh, magical crafting, again, you have been trained to spread magic scrolls and use enchanting equipment. I don't even know if that actually is in the game yet. They've done a lot of things that are flavor picks, as you'll see, uh, and they will literally tell you with like a little icon in many cases, if not all cases, that this is, you know, for role-playing purposes, it's a, a fun pick for you to take, but it's completely useless in this game. So again, kind of on you and you'd be like well then why pick it and again i'm the same way why fucking pick it but if you want to be a role player hey man there's there's times where my wizard you know happened to be particularly skilled at writing poems for some silly ass fucking reason because that was his thing didn't help us in, in the game itself when we played tabletop but it was fun for me to have that little part of his character fleshed out uh notice how his class equipment uh, as a wizard he comes up with a quarter staff a scholar's pack a component pouch that's going to be useful, of course, for spellcasting. A spell book, obviously, adventuring. Wizard's clothing, so just typical garb that he would wear. And, of course, we can edit equipment if we choose to do so, which we don't. Um, for this part, this is the fun part. So uh, the backgrounds can be different for everybody. I can be a sneaky fucking wizard. I can be a low-life fighter. I can be an academic rogue. Again, on you for how you want to pick this kind of shit. But notice that if you pick these things, everything changes over here as far as this stuff is concerned. Notice how the, your, your personality choices are, are different. Notice this stuff. So, example, for a wizard, and, and academic makes perfect sense. Notice how we're proficient already in arcana, nature, and insight if we take academic. Well, remember, arcana is one of those things that we could have unlocked, but we don't have to now. So that's kind of on you. If you're going to use it, your, your, your free skill unlocks on arcana and, and something else like insight, for example, that's fine. You don't have to pick this one. Pick something like a low life. I mean, literally... Proficient in sleight of hand, stealth, and deception. That's pretty fucking good. Proficient with these tools. Basically a, a good substitute for having a rogue. Well, we're going to have one on the team, so there's no need for this. Because of this, though, there's really no need for us to actually have this on the rogue, though. And again, because the rogue is going to actually going to see, you're going to have access to a lot of these proficiencies or can pick them naturally. I, I will probably make a low-life rogue just something for that reason. But again, you know, we kind of go with theme here. An academic wizard kind of makes fucking sense. And again... While this is already stuff that he was going to get, at least at con in insight, that frees me up. Notice how it gives us other stuff as well. So, for example, Runaway Antiquarian. You still have ties to the Antiquarians, and your relationship with them is already good. So that's nice. I think that's a, a faction in this game. Uh, notice how we have um, additional languages. We can choose two additional languages as a wizard, which is pretty fucking useful, I've got a feeling, in this game. And we even get even more background equipment. Uh, proficient with the Mana Colon Rosary, supposed to be useful to enchant an item. And again for what we fucking do. That makes perfect fucking sense. Uh, notebook, uh, which doesn't do anything in the game as far as I know. Uh, we have some extra gold, and we get some commoners clothing as well. Now, background personality. Notice this shit here. This is going to affect your dialogue options as well as just the way they generally speak in the game. They're, they will chime in and say certain things, and again, this is based on your personality flags as well as your alignment flags, which we'll talk about here in just a second. The background personality flags, for example, for this type of character, as an academic, we get uh, you can be a pragmatist, so a tendency to value practicality over principles. So again, if it's one of those where it's like, I would never kill, and then I'm like, I'm dying unless I kill, well, then I'm probably going to kill, because that's you know, being pragmatic. That sucks, but it's what it is. It's the people that fucking eat the other people that are dead on the fucking crash mountainside. They're pragmatists. They don't want to die. There's food right in front of them. Technically. 
metaphorically speaking. And as a result, while the horrible nightmares, I'm sure, persist to this day, it's still one of those things where I can't say as I fault them. They wanted to live. The ability to fucking, you know, suffer through that kind of shit is amazing, but it's one of those where they're a pragmatic person, and I have no problem with him being pragmatic as well. And maybe I'm a, a lawful character. I'm a wizard. Chances are I'm probably not. Uh, but a greedy makes sense. Egoism, a tendency to put oneself, friends, and family first at the expense of all others. Again, that kind of thing uh, sits pretty well for me. But if I don't want that, again, greed is another option here. Notice how greed tends to value wealth and comfort above all else. I'm a wizard, goddammit. What do you think I'm a wizard for? It's so I can have fucking you know, be better than everybody else around me and fucking be an awesome son of a bitch who has like all kinds of fucking money and wizard towers are expensive. So greed kind of makes sense. I'm going to go with those. Now, as far as the good, law, chaos, or evil, again, this is your obvious alignment restrictions. Notice, again, I can get pragmatism again. And if I do so, you'll see how pragmatism lights up even more over there. See how I shut it off, and this is the one that we have. So we're formal, pragmatist, casual, and greedy currently. Notice if I hit pragmatism again, it, it lights up a little more. This literally means we are more pragmatic than normal. It just means it's more likely to flag if I, if I think... Uh, I understand this right. Notice, notice, of course, we have other ones that we could hit again. I don't know that greed's in here. Yeah, it is. So we could be a a, a neutral, evil kind of character by being pragmatic and greedy. And again, we're doubling up on that shit. I got no problem with that. And we could be violent wizard if we so choose. Again, egoism could have been there twice because we could have picked it up here. Or lawfulness could have been there twice if we picked it here and here. Again, on you to, to flesh out your character as you see it. But again, a greedy pragmatist and, and doubling up on that really emphasizes what this character is kind of about. Notice that we have a, a standard array. This would be a, a typical spread that you could get and can just choose that yourself and then put them wherever it makes sense. And they even give you little pop-ups over here to let you know, hey, you're, you're about intelligence, con, and dexterity more likely as not as a wizard. Why? You don't have to go that route. But again, intelligence is your casting stat, so it makes sense that that's your biggie. So again, I could put the 15 down here, making it a 16, for example. And that's pretty good. That's not great. Um, and then I can do like 14 and 13 for dex and con, or however I want to spread those around. And then the 10, uh, the 12, the 10, and the 8 can be good. The strength, wisdom, or charisma in any order that you choose. Now, we can say optimize. And it'll put the spread for what it thinks makes sense for a wizard. And again, not particularly strong. That's okay. Not particularly fucking charismatic. Again, fuck you. I don't care. I'm a wizard. I'm all about money and power and shit like that. So again, it kind of makes sense. Uh, wisdom saves are important to me. Uh, because again, we have proficiency and in intelligence and wisdom saves. So again, the plus three and the plus one, that's not anything to sneeze at. This is not a good pick. Uh, to, to me, this is, again, you're trying to make... Your, your four characters awesome obviously the re-roll of the dice is what you want to and literally that's a really nice roll right there you could have fucking stellar stats just keep going until you don't see anything below a fucking 10 over here if you so choose I, again this is one where it, people are going to bitch about oh you're fucking min maxing like crazy like that's retarded right there an 18 and 18 for two fucking stats intelligence and say dex you're going to fucking hit shit you're going to be fucking really smart as fuck that's an awesome character right there I would be silly to pass that up that's what I'm going to do why because we're going to do point by Notice if we do free edit, we have infinite picks. We could literally make Captain America, goddammit. We could be 18s and fucking everything. Well, 19 can be the plus one everything. But we could be fucking stellar. Well, I'm not going to do that. That's just crazy. So we go back to the 27. And point by, for those of you that don't know, is not 27 points just to spread through this. Because, again, for six fucking points, or sorry, six fucking uh, attributes here, you divide that by six, roughly, you're going to get what? 4.5, I want to say. Uh, just off the top of my head, and that's 4.5 points that you could add to everything, right? So everything should be like a 13, uh, and then like three of them could be like a 14 or something like that. I don't think it works that way. I think uh, the more you up something, the more points you burn. You know, see how it just jumped from eight, uh, 20 to 18 just by going up another point? And that's the point of point by. It literally restricts you. But if you want to get like a really good one, sell it 16 over here. That's not bad. And get yourself a con that's you know, respectable, like a 12 perhaps. Get that dexterity up to like a 14 or a 15. And that leaves you a couple points besides just to fucking dilly dink around just to make your character a little bit better at something else. Like that. And that would be a point by and that can make sense to me. Right? And again, is this a stellar character by any stretch of the imagination? No, it's fucking pretty shit, quite frankly. But point by is I don't want to say fair. It's something that we would tabletop rule. I mean, everybody in your, has their own house rules, and they would be like, oh, well, we do you know, the typical 4d6 die roll for each ability. 
you take the the four that you six sided die that you roll and throw out the lowest, and that's you know what you write down. You write it down six fucking times, uh, so so six separate rolls. You roll those numbers down, and that's what you fucking get. You decide where to fucking spread them. I've seen house rules where we literally say you throw a four d six for your strength. What did you get? A three? Well, boy, your character sucks because you rolled all ones, huh? Okay, so you're not a strength-based character now. Oh, what do you mean? I don't get to pick? No, you fucking just rolled for strength, and that's what you get. So, again, everyone's different on how they do their fucking spreads. And, again, I'm not going to tell you the right or wrong way. I'm just not going to do free edit because that's clearly cheating. I mean, I suppose if you did, like, free edit, you could do, like, I want to have a wizard that starts off with a fucking intelligence of goddamn 19. Because 19, the level 9 spells would be technically the highest you could cast. Well, in this game, the highest we can cast is, like, level 5, I think. And there's no plans in the future to make that higher so literally all i need is like a 15 or more so 16 is actually pretty fucking good um and i could have myself like a nice 14 con and say another 16 over here for like dexterity and then just go for midland shit for over here and, and say you know eh, wisdom maybe i'm a little smarter than normal or wiser than normal and there you go and that would be the point spread that i would do and be okay with that so 10 16 14 16 12 and 10 let's see how we do if we can get close to that the other way. So we said 10, 16, 14, 16. Close. That's pretty fucking close. And the only way to get that to a 12 would be to take the strength down the tiniest bit and go like that. And I would actually be okay with that. That is a solid, solid character. So again, for point by, this is what I'm going to do for the characters. I'll min max it as best I can, but using point by without free yet. What else we got? We got, uh, notice we have uh, intelligence and a wisdom flag here. This is showing you your proficiencies with those types of saving throws. Something that I'm not too familiar with with D&D, because again, I haven't played in so fucking long. Sorry, I need a little sip of coffee there. Um, is there saving throws for every attribute. You know, so there's charisma saving throws. There's wisdom, intelligence, con, dex, strength. Whereas I'm used to pathfinders, you know, your fortitude, your reflex, and your, your will saves. And I'm fine with those, too. It's just this is gets weird for me so i'll have to remember that for example if i get held with something where a strength based saving throw to break out of a web spell or i'm, I'm just talking out my ass now because i don't know what a strength based saving throw would entail but obviously i'm bad at it and that kind of makes sense so it's one of those where some common sense is really going to dictate a lot of things here notice that we have uh class skills to pick two uh we have uh, one ancestry language and two background languages to pick and again that's because of our choices that we made for the type of wizard in their, our background that we had so that's a, a decent amount of shit so let's talk about our class skills so notice we already have ones already flagged so we already have arcana we already have insight we already have nature and again that came from my background pick right so two more to pick they are highlighted so we have arcana which we can't pick again we have history which is you know got the plus sign here insight which again we already have investigation it's here uh, medicine right next to it and religion down here now notice how investigation has the eye read this shit uh, although part of the rule set and valid for role-playing purposes this element is not used in the crown of the master main campaign so again there's no performance there's really no investigation animal handling doesn't particularly exist in this game uh, uh, but sleight of hand um, does have uh, some actual uses in this game and again that's used for pickpocketing and shit like that now if this means that you can't do this unless you're a rogue that might be what this is describing here and that's fine i suppose i don't particularly like that if that's the truth but it's what it is uh, notice that we cannot pick them so it doesn't much matter for this character but for other characters that could get it it's going to be annoying that it's going to be not really used in this game um point is what are we going to pick them for our character well then obvious choices that are history medicine or religion we only get two history intelligence check makes sense medicine wisdom religion also intelligence so let's just uh, double down on the fucking intelligence shit so we're a smarty pants we're the know-it-all wizard and notice how we have proficiency in the man and rosaries and the scroll kits and again that came from being both a wizard and from being the, the uh, acolyte or whatever the fuck we picked uh, academic that's what it was the academic that we were knows for weapons it tells you all the shit that you need down here and now we have language and everyone's going to have common and if i was an elf i would have elvish for free if i was a halfling i'd get halfling for free if i was a dwarf i get dwarvish for free so again common sense shit here applies but you're a stupid ass human and as such common is all you fucking get but 
we have an ancestry language we can pick, and two background languages. Now notice, some of these are hidden, and some of these are, again, useless. Like in Halflings, nothing that gives any good. Same with Terran, Giant, or Goblin. They haven't encoded anything in the game that, that matter. So they're trying to steer you away from picking shit that doesn't matter. But again, for role-playing purposes, maybe you were raised by Giants. So again, feel free to pick that when we get to background language. Uh, I know me. Uh, I pick shit that fucking is useful. So I got this old term, I'm and I totally want that. Now we got two background languages that unlocks everything except for, again, our spy code book and I got assuming that you'd have either be a spy background to unlock that or maybe be a rogue perhaps we shall see but two more picks you better believe I'm going to go with shit that matters like orcish we don't have any orcs on the team so that's something that we could talk to that could be a value and maybe I want to fucking uh, romanticize the elf woman that we're going to have on the team so I'll get elvish as a background choice for languages as well moving on this is where we get to pick our spells. Notice uh, three class cantrips that we get. And again, as we level up, we should actually unlock more cantrips, if I understand correctly. There is a potential to get a free cantrip if you play, I want to say, a high elf. Um, could be both elves, but at least the high elf, I believe, is the one that gets a free cantrip. Again, they're from a high magic society. You could be a high elf and be nothing more than a goddamn fighter and never cast spells ever in your life. But you'll still have access to an infant used cantrip. Just one. Maybe it's just the light spell. Maybe your mom and dad want you to be able to see in the fucking dark so you can fucking stab them orcs in the face. Whatever. Up to you, though. Notice for me, though, being a normal, dudley ass human, I gotta pick shit for myself. So a light spell is a common one for me, because, again, I don't have the ability to see in dark vision or, you know, that fucking cool shit that all the other races are gonna get. And I need to see some shit. And this game does, and I love this part of this game, does have the ability uh, to penalize you because you can't see the fucking target. And likewise for the bad guys. They, they can't fucking see you in the dark. They have a penalty to the fucking swing. This is awesome. This is a, the thing that I thought that was missing from Pathfinder Kingmaker specifically. Because the light infinite use cantrip is fucking awesome. To see the fucking pretty settings and the surrounding. Just, you know, it's a good game. It's a good looking game. This one is too. So it's, again, that's nice. But there was always more to the light spell. I mean, this was the, 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 the equalizer, in my opinion, of the humans versus all those fucking all the other races that had fucking uh, infravision in, in the older system and dark vision, I think is what they call it now, and low light vision and blah 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 We ain't got that shit. You're a fucking normal-ass human. Well, I got a light fucking spell, bitch. So I can fucking see. There you go. Problem solved. So that's one of my cantrips. Well, I got two more. Well, I want to get some damage. So of my choices, I'm going to get Firebolt, but of my choices, Acid Splash is a viable option. You notice how it's an AUE, technically, and that we can hit two targets with that shit. Chill Touch. Hit one target with that one, and that one actually stops their uh, regen or healing. It's just fucking nice. Uh, Dancing Light, that, that doesn't do any damage. Uh, Firebolt, we talked about that briefly. You say that it basically hits and does fire damage. Poison Spray does poison damage, which is heavily resisted in, in, in traditional D&D settings. I can't imagine it's going to be any different in this game, so this could be a bad choice in my opinion, but I don't know that. And the range is kind of shit, quite frankly. Uh, Ray of Frost has a nice range on it, though, and this is a nice freezing range. This one, actually, if you hold Alt, it gives you information on all these, but if you hold Alt down on Ray of Frost, notice how it also has another thing where it doesn't, it inflicts the hindered condition, where they move slower. Move speed minus two. This is a way for you to fucking lock down a target. Well, not lock down, but slow down a target, and as such, that could help your other teams like rushing like let's say I'm the wizard in the back fucking rank because obvious right and the bad guy or my good guy teammates are up front kicking their uh, bad guy's ass and some uh, bad guy sneaks around the fucking back and tries to fucking club me to death I hit him with a fucking ray of frost to slow him down and, and run away run away like a scared little wizard would and while I'm running away and they're trying to catch me and they're getting slowed down by my ray of frost I have a chance for one of my team or more of my team to come back and reinforce me me from the bad guy that's trying to kick my ass. That's a way to use Ray of Frost. Shadow Armor is a generic temp HP, and if it's an infinite use thing, it's kind of fucking hard to turn down an infinite 3 HP. Now, yeah, you're probably not going to uh, cast this and cast this and cast this and cast this more. It's going to fucking annoy you, because again, you're casting and you're not ca uh, doing any damage. So I'm like, I got 3 health back, and then the guy hits me for like 12. Well, how did that fucking help you? Maybe it kept you from dying, but I'm not going to recast it while trying to fucking kill the son of a bitch that just fucking took nine of my fucking health away. So again, useful-ish. Shadow Bagger's a nice one in that it's auto-hit. However, there's a chance for a saving throw to ignore all damage, which is the only reason we're not taking it. Whereas Fireball, all of the is required is that A, they're susceptible to fire and spell damage, and B, that I hit them. So it's on me to fucking hit the mark. So I'm cool with Firebolt. Um, Shocking Grass is a melee touch attack, so it's interesting and it does have uh, the other component to it where it inflicts the shock condition where they can't use reactions this is the the for those of you that don't know what that means um 
if you're mailing somebody. Okay. Uh, let's say I hit them with a shocking grasp, and then I want to get the fuck out of Dodge. I fucking shock and grasp them, hit them, do damage, and now they can't react. What does that mean? It means I can run away, and I don't have to worry about attacks of opportunity from that motherfucker, because he cannot react to me leaving. This was the staple in, in pen and paper anyway for in D&D, for wizards to be like, oh, fuck, <laughs> run the fuck away. It's like tasing the motherfucker and getting the fuck out of there, you know, GTFO. So this is useful. It's just, again, I'm trying not to be in melee, so I'm going to pass. Sparkle, this is a new one, so you see, target up to three objects that can be illuminated and light them up immediately. Anything else we know about that shit? Casting time into a bonus action. Now that could be useful. Oh, special. A spell effects ignites light sources. Oh, I wonder if this means like lighting up torches and candles and shit on the wall. That's interesting. Uh, and true strike, of course, your, your typical stupid fucking trap uh, ability. Increase your chance to hit a target you can see one time. Notice how the casting time is an action, which means you're wasting this round to cast a spell, hoping that next round you have a chance to swing at the motherfucker and you get what's called advantage. Advantage in this game and disadvantage is something you should talk about. Let's say I'm trying to hit you this period, in, in generically. I'm trying to hit you and I have advantage or disadvantage. That means I roll twice. Doesn't matter if it's advantage or disadvantage. You always roll twice. Why? Because if it's advantage, you take the better of the two rolls. If it's disadvantage, you take the worst of the two rolls. You see the, the appeal here of advantage versus disadvantage? So, if I have advantage, thanks to True Strike, that means I get to roll twice and I have a better chance of hitting you. Well, and here's the problem with True Strike. What if I just swung at you in the round where True Strike was available? Instead of casting the spell, I'm wasting my turn doing that. Let's just swing at you. That's one roll. Yes, I don't have advantage, but that's a roll, and I can hit you. Then, next turn, I swing yet again. That's still another roll. So you did roll technically twice, but in this instance, I had a chance to hit you two fucking times. Yes, I could whiff both times. However, let's hope that one of those hit, then at least I did the same amount of damage as, as casting True Strike and swinging once. And I did it faster, because I have two rounds to fucking hit you twice. Pop, pop. So True Strike is kind of a trap. There's instances where this is of value. Let's be real clear on this. Like, if I'm Using True Strike to set, set up a firebolt for range where I'm like, you know, I'm not in any danger. I don't have any fucking thing to do but have time to fucking kill that motherfucker way the hell over there. I cast my True Strike. Next turn, I cast my firebolt. And again, I'll have a better than average chance to fucking hit the son of a bitch. There is some appeal there. But it's very limited. And again, it's one of those where it's just not my thing. Have you said that? Uh, we got our firebolt, we got our light spell, what else might we want? Well, we should talk about shine. This is a new one to me. What does this guy do? An enemy you can see becomes luminous for a while. Saving throw. So again, I'm assuming if he makes a saving throw that he, he's not lit up. Uh, what we got here? Light source. Two plus... Uh, or that's the, the dice that you're seeing there. That's the range. That's a cube of range. So two squares, if you will, of range that is brightly lit four that are dimly lit. Save each turn to cancel. So he's trying to make a saving throw to not be shining, glowing at you. Eh, I'd rather grab dancing lights because you can control where it fucking moves. Basically, it's like you making a light source at distance and you can control that with concentration. Hence, it's a concentration spell. And then, boom, move it. Boom, move it. And again, by moving it, you're moving it to a new location. It lights up that guy and your team can now see that motherfucker in the corner easier for everyone to hit him. So I could see Dancing Lights being a solid choice. Uh, the Knowing B is one that distracts the bad guy. They have disadvantage on their concentration checks. So if they're trying to concentrate on a spell, they roll twice now, and again, they take the worst of the two results, potentially causing their spell to fail. Against Caster Tights, I could see this being extremely useful. Dazzle, uh, this one this is just probably like a blinding effect. Cannot take reactions, and as a my student armor class, that's a useful one. Uh, notice how the, the target one target and it's a melee hit so we have to hit the target with this the melee touch attack probably and that's a no bueno for me as well um i don't mind doubling down on different damage types is shadow armor a concentration no i did want uh there was that one that i was thinking about what the fuck was it called that was um surprising lights it's a bonus action sparkle yeah, bonus action. Let's try Sparkle. Fucking give it a go. What the hell? Uh, now we pick our actual spells. Notice that we have six to pick from. Um, in here, no right or wrong answer, technically speaking. However, see the ones that got the little book? That's a ritual. Okay, so if you pick these now and have them in your choice of spells you can cast for the day, 
that's a ritual now. So we do not have to actually um, expend a spell slot to cast it. You know the ritual. You just have to take 10 minutes of your time every day to cast the ritual without burning a spell slot. And now you have access to comprehend language or detect magic or identify, which obviously identifies a solid choice. Hell, I'll even grab a detect magic. Comprehend language, I don't give a fuck. We can do that one later. Um... Of these other ones, now obviously you're going to want some utility spells, you want some protection spells, and you want some crowd control, you want some damage. Well, we only got four picks left. That's a lot of fucking things to grab. Well, Magic Missile, just to give it to you a heads up, is a staple. There's nothing wrong with that spell. Um, a really good crowd control spell can be things like Color Spray, Charm Person, even though it's one person. Uh, grease, Fog Cloud is kind of crowd control-y. Hades Laughter is crowd control um, sleep is crowd control. Hell, even Thunder Wave, while it's a damaging spell, it does the double purpose of wants to knocking motherfuckers back. Uh, pushes away a target, yep. Yeah. So again, we can knock them off a cliff kind of shit, and it's centered on you, so you basically just explode in the big force damage. But notice the other part here. Puts out fires, removes on fire, which means literally if you are on fire, I think this might put that out, or if you see fire in the environment, it could put it out, so you can see the appeal in that one. And again, another damaging spell and crowd control at the same time. Uh, Mage Armor, on the other hand, is another staple. You cast it, and for many, many hours, you have a decent armor class. For a wizard, that's a, a big boost. So that's our protection spell. Shield and protection versus evil and good are other solid choices. Notice how shield is a reaction spell. So again, if you can hold this down and get more information on this. Literally, your armor class will increase. It'll give you the option. You'll have to burn a spell slot to use it. So the downside is that it's a, oh, fuck, don't hit me. Especially if it's like magic missiles coming your way. This would be an amazing spell to have in your back pocket. The downside is, like I said, it burns up spell slots like it's fucking candy. That's kind of a bummer. Um, we only got one more pick to go, so we've got to be kind of choosy here. False life, eh, it's okay. Uh, 1d4 plus 4 temp HP. Again, we could have gone with the infinite use cantrip and gave us 3 HP temporarily as often as we fucking want. Uh, but this is still better, I suppose. Feather fall, another good choice for some utility. A nice AOE spell in Burning Hands. However, we are got Thunder Wave, and it's probably easier to set that up than in Burning Hands because it's an AOE explosion centered on you. Not that you should get surrounded. Um, last spell. I'm gonna go pick. Fuck, it just picks up. Fucking God damn it. Uh, let's go with Sleep. You gotta have a fucking Sleep spell as a wizard, right? That's fucking like a staple too. And now, now here's our character. We have three different model faces. I would, I would just, again, I'm not picking anyone here, but, but I would say that this is basically Caucasian-ish face, Asian face, and um, um, African-American, for example, or Jamaican. Um, we're playing a male character, obviously. Notice how we have different face choices after that. Uh, I'm going to change my hair color, like, right fucking now, though, because that looks stupid. Yeah, it looks all right. Uh, man, got some nice beard going. What kind of beards we got? We got beard shapes nine. Whoa. That's a wizard beard if ever I saw one. Nine. What the hell is that? Four is nothing. It's like mutton chops or something there. It's a good Santa beard. I'm going with that one. That one looks fucking tits. Maybe I'll even make myself a little more gray here. Notice, that, uh, by the way, you can kind of scroll down sometimes with these things, so make sure to, to check to see if there's something lower than what you're seeing right now. But this is a nice wizardly look, I'd say. Uh, we can make ourselves, uh, look, I get myself a name. Brother of the Family Mutant. And we have Skin Tone. So are we, uh, weird ass fucking blue skinned elf? Are we gonna be a tan man? Maybe I'm a pale old ghost of a human being because, you know, I'm a wizardly guy and, you know, I don't get out in the sun very much. That looks about right. Uh, what else we got here? We got hair color. Okay, eye color. Now, this is where we get trippy. Um, notice the eyes. I can make myself have blue eyes, black eyes, brown eyes, you know, whatever. Red eyes. I can make myself, like, have eyes that damn near glow with, like, magical power. Kind of fucking dig that idea. Something a little more bright. Uh, physique. Are you buff, wizard man? Are you scrawny-ass wizard man? Well, probably scrawny. Age. We can make ourselves wrinkled. Look how old I am. Oh, my God. I don't know. Where's my Fertina? Uh, we got voices. We got three different male voices, and we also have three different female voices. Uh, since this limits you, uh, I would suggest that you have at least one of the opposite sex on your party of four. 
that we can have a unique voice for everybody. So what's our voice choice? We click here and it'll, you can hear something. The fight is not yet over. Your skill is impressive. That's actually pretty good for a wizard. What's this? You're one? still in the fight, my interesting. Not as taxing as I expected. That sounds pretty good too. Let there be light. Undignified, but necessary. You don't sound old enough to have that voice. What this one sounds strength? Right. That was simplicity itself. Nice. Pronouns as a she, a he, or they. Again, your choice. Additional backstory. We're not going to waste time on that. That's our character. So that's our brother mute. Now let's make a new character. We'll kind of speed through this next part. Uh, we're going to make a rogue. I like having halflings be rogues. Notice how we have choices again: an island halfling or marsh halfling. The difference is down here. So we got a con, charisma. We don't give a shit about charisma, but advantage on dexterity checks for acrobatics. That's pretty fucking cool. Uh, what else do these guys get? Uh, areas with marshes and ponds are. In a human atmosphere are considered swamp terrain. And that matters because they probably have nimbleness in the swamp or some shit. Um, extra con means they're extra durable. Extra hit points. And since we don't got much in the way of healing, that could be a benefit. So let's go with Marsh. And want to check. Female Marsh Halfling. And she's going to be a rogue. Notice the roguish archetypes here. Again, the thief, the dark weaver, the shadow caster. That's what she's going to be. Oh, she can cast wizard spells and cantrips from the divination, illusion, and necromancy, and abjuration schools. Now, that's a laundry list of shit in there. Again, some attack spells with illusion and necromancy, and abjuration and divination are usually about buffage or sensing things, uh, protecting you from stuff. So again, this is a solid buffer class, if you will. Uh, and notice how at level 9, they'll get shadow retribution if you are targeted by a damaging spell, whether it damage you or not. You can cast a cantrip in reaction on the caster, so you get smacked. Fuck you! Reaction! Kind of cool. So we're going to go with that type of rogue again. What was that called? Shadow Caster? Yeah, that's what we're going to call her. And then Shadow of the Clan Caster. Uh, notice that higher level rogue stuff. This will be the other shit that you get. And again, notice how it talks about the rogue shark types at level 3. That's what we just mentioned. But again, Cunning Action is going to be useful for her. Uh, Uncanny Dodge will be useful. I know somebody avoiding the ones where we talked about getting an extra skill point or a proficiency bonus and center and so forth. Like our ability score bumps here at level 4 and 8. Evasion is going to be useful for her. So, again, a lot of real good shit for being a typical rogue. She gets some really nice proficiencies down here. Rogue skills that rogues are amazing at being masters of everything. And you got to love the fact that longsword, rapier, and short sword fucking always show up for these guys. Light armor, no less. And dex intelligence, so two stats to really give a shit about for these type characters. And again, you don't have to go that route. You'd be a strong fucking uh, con rogue if you so choose. But these are the ones you're going to get saved and throw proficiencies in. Those are the ones you should probably invest points in. Um. Let's move on to the next. What kind is she going to be? Uh, well, sorry, let's go back to previous here. What else we had here? Uh, we're going to pick four skills of acrobatics, athletics, deception, insight, intimidation, investigation, perception, performance, persuasion, slight of hand, and stealth. That's a lot of shit. Uh, notice how it's select two proficient skills or tools to double their proficiency bonus. That's going to be really useful for us. So if you want to be really good at lock picking, this is your chance. If you want to be really good at stealthing, this is your chance. You're an expertise, motherfucker. Just kind of fucking cool. Um, it's a laundry list shit, and sleight of hand is going to fall in our category, so I don't have to go low life because, again, we already had access to sleight of hand, stealth, and deception probably as a rogue anyway. Spy, on the other hand, is tempting, and stealth and deception, again, no big deal there. Proceeding with nature and poisoner's kit, that's fucking cool. Might have had that already as a rogue, but I don't know that. I'm paying attention. But you get a crafting basic poison uh, scroll book or pamphlet, however you want to call it, to, to train yourself in making, like, poison arrows, I want to say. And they start you off with a poisoner's kit, no less, which is pretty fucking cool. Now, what kind of rogue spy are we going to be? Greed? No, we're a spy. We're not greedy. Cynic? That can make sense. Cautionous? Uh, caution for a spy makes fucking sense. we got two to pick from. Uh, pragmatist? Yeah, I take that. That makes sense. We're a cautious, casual, pragmatist spy. Now, down for alignment, again, I don't mind doubling up on the caution, Pragmatist, uh, yeah, we can do that. Or that be so we'd be basically between good and evil. We'd basically be probably true neutral. And as a spy, eh, I don't know if I believe that. Spies are usually evil uh, or chaotic. Eh, maybe not chaotic. They're probably more lawful evil because they're working for a cause. That cause is probably the law, hence being a spy. But if you're an evil spy and chaotic evil spy, that might mean that you're all about fucking spying on the kingdom, for example. Uh, I don't mind that. Violence could be okay. Greed, again, we said no. Uh, she's not kind. Spy. She's not like Robin Hood or anything like that. Or altruistic or anything like that. Um, I 
I'm going to say she's a, a cynic. She's cautious. That makes sense. From now, again, we're going to do our point buy again. Now it's, again, three different stats. Intelligence doesn't have to be no 16 like we did before. So don't think that that's a thing that, that matters to you. So, again, we can keep that fucking low for now. Oops. Um, but uh, I'm cool with having a con stat of, like, at least a 13 or 14. Let's say, or say 13 for now. Dex is probably your main stat. So let's actually get that as fucking high as I can take it. 17 looks good. Um, intelligence... The more intelligent you have, the better off you are. So let's see if we can get that to a 14. Hell, let's get con to 14. From there, these guys can all be garbage. I, I don't mind if they really suck. 10, 10, and 10. That's fine with me. You're mostly about dexterity. Having the ability to suck up some damage every now and again for me and smack around and having a high enough intelligence to do something with those skills could be of value. I'm cool with that. And I hate stupid people on my team. Uh, notice how she has intelligence and dex as her proficiency bonuses, and those are my two highest ones anyway, so that makes her perfect sense. Four class skills. Notice the ones that, again, are already highlighted. So we already have stealth, uh, nature, deception, and, of course, we've got our smith's tools, but we're getting these tools down here. We'll talk about that in a minute. So for these ones up here, the ones that are available to us, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we can't get all of them. We only got four to pick from. And they're even us warming us away from uh, performance in sleight of hand, but I'm going to fucking pick it just because, again, sleight of hand. Uh, picking pockets and all that shit should be sleight of hand. So what it says it's not in the game, I think that's a lie. Acrobatics, though, makes sense for her. Again, she is rogue. Dexterity makes sense, right? So these ones are amazing for her. Notice how strength... Notice I, I just noticed this, that these ones are all based on the, the column above them. So con, nothing in here. For dexterity, these are dex based. Strength, this is a strength based uh, athletics check. Uh, notice how we have intelligence here, uh, and we have wisdom, and then of course charisma. She's not particularly charismatic, so persuasion and shit like that kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. But intimidation, I still think, is a solid choice for a spy. Um, I'll do that, and I'll do. Well, that says it's useful. Or useless. I'm going to say athletics. Notice now we got class expertise. Notice all the ones that we've already picked. Highlighted up now, as well as this one down here. So you see how we can double up on some these tools shit, right? And that's something that I could fucking really get behind. So being really good at these tools is, you know, we're an expert at that. Being really good at sleight of hand or stealth could be extremely valuable. I'm going to take stealth because I think that's going to be a good mechanic for us to exploit. Now, background language, we get two and only two. Notice we didn't get anything else. Like the wizard had access to like three altogether. We only get two. What are we going to get? Well, she's got common. She's got the spy code book for free. Again, probably for being a spy. Um, oh, what did that say on that? Codes and cipher. Okay. Uh, she's a halfling, so of course she has that. But again, it shouldn't be used very much in the game. Again, we have a, an elf that will be on the party, so she might want to be able to talk to them in Elven in case we need to like switch languages up in the middle of fucking speak so that the, uh, the Orcish army can't fucking hear what we're fucking saying or understand what we're saying. I could turn south real quick where they fucking hate us for that. Uh, but maybe she wants Old Sumerian. Maybe she wants Dwarvish. We try to diversify a little bit. What kind of pretty little rogue are we going to make? Again, face types we got. Six of them to choose from. Uh, she was Shadow of Family Caster. Uh, let's see. Six faces to choose from. What we got here? We got that one. Nah. That one's okay, I guess. Big slim face. That one looks kind of cool. I'll kind of dig face, too. Let's do with that. Uh, skin tone, I'm okay with the way it is right now. Hair shape. 18 choices. Good lord, man. Yeah. Got that fro. Uh, what kind of color here? Uh, she a blonde. Let's go blonde for now. I kind of dig that one. That feels more elf, though. Oh. No, if she'd be a rose, she'd have her hair tight. Right? It'd be fucking not flowing, wouldn't be in the way. Wouldn't have a chance to get in her fucking eyes. So let's see if we got something that's a little like that would be stupid. No. Hmm. Hair up. I dig it. Uh, do we want to do that? Then let's do black hair. I like that. Eye color. She's also going to have dark eyes. Um, sounds good. Uh, she's not old. She's a halfling. So she's already a teeny tiny person. That's fine. 
All right, so that gives us our shadow cast for the next character. Uh, now we're going to want to have a paladin. And the paladin I liked uh, the dwarfs for. Uh, because of Hill Dwarf, both Wisdom and Con. Con Dexterity. No, it wasn't the Dwarfs. What was it? Was it the Elves? It was the Halfling. Charisma. Dexterity, though, no bad. Half Elf. There we go. Half Elf. We're going to make them uh, female Half Elf, and she's going to be our Paladin. And that's because, again, that bonus to Charisma knows increases two other scores by one point each. And that could be like Strength and Con. Uh, so Charisma. Strength con build probably makes perfect sense for her to be a half elf. Uh, notice we have common languages of common elvish and one language of your choice. So we got three languages all together right there. Fey ancestry again, same throws advantage against charm and immunity to magical sleep. Even though we're only a half elf, that's fucking powerful. Um, bonus skills, any two skills, that's nice uh, upgrade right there. And of course, she has the dark vision ability, which makes her fucking badass. Uh, she will be a paladin. Uh, and at higher levels, knows how to get uh, divine smite, fighting style. That's going to be important. Paladin cast, spell casting, channel divinity in their sacred oaths at level three. That's why she's going to be a devotee. Um, variety of other cool shit. So yeah, and uh, for the sacred oaths, for those that are worried, uh, we have again oath of Tiramar. People swear by oath of the motherland is a solid damaging type paladin. Oath of devotion, on the other hand, it feels more like a cleric. You, know, you get your shield spell protection from evil and good, lesser restoration and aid, dispel magic and revivify. Feels like a cleric feel to it. So I'm cool with that. And again, turn the unholy and sacred weapon, all that shit that I'd fucking want to be as a paladin. So that's the why she's going to be the devotee. Um, she starts with a decent kit of stuff. She's going to be a pretty good attacker for us. Uh, and we have this luck of deity. We have a neutral deity. Got of elements pass. Valor and fidelity. Patron of Paladins. Yeah, it sounds like a good and lawful kit. Sounds good. Uh, and I don't think there's a, an alignment restriction for being a Paladin in this game, which is kind of trippy. Uh, what kind of Paladin? She's an Acolyte. Notice how she's an Acolyte. She gets um, proficient in religion, nature, and insight and gets stuff that a Paladin would probably jive with. Herbalism kit, so again, medicine can be of importance for her as well. Um, that's pretty cool. Lawkeeper is another obvious choice. Perception and Intimidation. Proficient in martial weapons, but she's already proficient in those anyway as a paladin, if I'm not mistaken. Um, again, kind of cool. I think um, and it's a, a philosopher and an aristocrat. Again, just because you're a paladin doesn't mean you don't have a noble family or whatever. So maybe your family pushed you into being a paladin because they wanted to have someone on the council kind of shit. You know, so that's cool. History, persuasion, intimidation. Yeah. So we're going to be charisma based. Persuasion and intimidation makes sense. Lawkeeper. Perception, intimidation, intimidation again that makes sense. Acolyte. Nothing in here smacks of being a paladin. As far as the, except for the religion, obviously. Uh, as far as the high charisma. So I'm aristocrat. Sounds fucking cool. What's philosopher got? Medicine, persuasion. Let's do aristocrat. Uh, we are egoism. We put ourselves, our family first. Hence the aristocrat. Um, and. Authority and of course rules and beliefs with authority and leadership. Because you follow rules and laws, order they're not the chaos. I think we're going to be authority egoism. Uh, and I don't want to double up on that. Lawful good, so she should be authority or lawful one of those. Uh, she can be cynic. That seems weird though. She's altruistic or kind. That's basically our choice here. Um, she got a heart of gold. She's an altruistic person. Um, so you see I didn't double up anything here except for authority. So again, she's going to be more authoritarian than anyone else because, again, that's her bearing, if you will. Uh, again, point by here. Notice, again, the strength, con, charisma is what they're saying is your important shit. We don't probably need a charisma to fucking 16, but let's put it there for the time being and see if we can get a strength to 16. No. Con to 16. No. It's because it's plus 2, this versus plus 1, plus 1. Um, there we go. There we go. Now we can get to 16. Uh, so that's our spread there. She doesn't have to be particularly dexterous because she's going to be wearing full armor. She doesn't have to be particularly bright. We can get her wisdom up maybe a little. And this is probably a little overkill. Let's take these down. Notice how this, by taking these two down, that gives us four more points to play with. We can get these back to being neutral. I hate having characters with a penalty, uh, for those of you that don't know. Um, 
only time I really allow it is if it thematically makes sense. You know, like my wizard, who's not particularly strong, strength of nine is okay. Uh, a halfling or a, a, a dwarf not having a, a strength or a dex, depending on which one we're talking about, above a fucking eight makes sense to me. So again, everyone's going to play that a little different. But I think this is a solid character. If I took away from the dexterity and tried to bump intelligence, that could be okay if she's not a complete idiot. But I'd honestly, for a paladin, I'd probably be more inclined to go wisdom. So let's go like that. 15, 8, 15, 10, 12, 16. Sounds good to me. From here, uh, notice how we have two ancestry skills and then we have two class skills. We've got a lot going for us here. Uh, what two are we going to pick from ancestry? Notice how we already have um, intimidation, persuasion, history already uh, open for us. So that's pretty nice. So athletics makes sense. Uh, medicine makes sense. And again, for charisma, performance is useless, but for deception could be okay. It feels weird to have a, a paladin that's fucking deceiving people, but again, it's one of those things where you can flavor it any way you want. So we're definitely going athletics. Uh, let's get uh, let's get medicine. Class skills now. Notice how we could have grabbed medicine on this one, or athletics either. So if we didn't want either of those, and the choices that we got are kind of crappy, because again, religion's all right, and insight is okay, but that's our only choices. And if that's not what you wanted, um, then you should probably uh, change these up. So let's say I don't want religion. So let's say I'll save athletics for that one. So let's grab uh, medicine again and deception, because fuck it. And now we can grab insight here and athletics here. Notice how we have no tools proficiency, but for weapons and armor, we got simple and martial, light, medium, and heavy armor, and the shield, like a true paladin should. Ancestry language, you get one, and then two background languages. She's already common and elvish. Let's grab her halfling for her halfling teammate. Background languages, she also speaks uh, Dwarvish and Old Tamarian. And we're going to make her paladin. Let's make her here. Oops, hair. Don't have white as a choice. Really? I guess that's close. Ah. Let's make her the blonde. Okay, faces. Uh, again. Faces. I like that one. That's kind of like the baby face look. Um, eye color. I like the the powder blue. Works with me. Skin tone, again, I'm cool with that. Eh, maybe she's a little more tan than that, though. She's been out in the fucking wild as a paladin. She's out there doing her thing. Um, and physique, she's going to be strong. Maybe not that butch, but she's definitely not a slacker. And she's not old. Uh, hair color, eye color, we're good there and there. Uh, hair shape. A tight bun. Makes sense. Don't want to get it in your way. I'm cool with that. Uh, the name. She's devotee, right? So she's going to be um, Sandra, family devotee. And that's just a reminder. What the hell just happened? Oh, damn it. Don't do that. Cassandra wrong. I think so. I have no idea. Uh, of the house devotee and face. I gotta get back to my fucking colors. Everything's looking weird now. Damn it. Here in the bun. There we go. Face. I want the baby face look. Which one was that? That one. Yeah, there we go. And then she had the powder blue eyes. Blonde hair. She was reasonably fit. She wasn't old. Voices. Perhaps if you tried to be loud instead? Interesting. As he Heave thought. now, all your strength. A little light is always welcome. Let there be light. I really thought I... Uh, never mind. That works for me. Hopefully I didn't pick the same voice for her. I actually don't remember what voice I picked for my fucking... Uh... Oh, where'd you go? Shadowcaster. Hmm, next character. Oh, we got, we got, uh, all right, so we have a rogue, we got a paladin, we got a wizard, and now we need a fighter. So the fighter can be a dwarf, uh, and I don't mind them being a con dex or con wisdom. Con dex, again, female character, 
cool with that. Again, I could have gone Hewan. I could have gone half elf. Hell, there's decent elves in here that, that would have made sense. But again, I want to mix things up a little bit. Uh, and heavy crossbow. That's not bad. Even though a fighter should have access to that already. That's pretty cool. Uh, plus two to Constitution saving throw. Snow dwarf endurance. That's fucking nice. I like that. Right on. And she's a fighter. Martial art type for fighters. This is again where we can get a spell blade. So she'll be spell of the family blade. <laughs> blade. The spell casting again. Her spell wizarding spells at level three on up are going to be uh, cantrips and wizard spells from the conjuration, evocation, transmutation, and enchantment set. A lot of attack. Spell. Not to say there's not some buffs in there, transmutation, for example, but again, as a fighter, that makes perfect fucking sense. Want to get me some fucking suit of bull strength going up in there and just whoop on some ass? Here you go. Solid choice. A magic weapon buff into the fray and spell tyrant. Pretty fucking cool stuff. Close. Alright, so that's going to be my fighter. What kind of fighter is she? Is she a straight up cell sword? Or is she an acolyte? Hmm. See, she's going to be all about strength and con. She don't have to be particularly bright in anything. So if it's not athletics or dexterity based, yeah, probably not make a lot of sense. Cell sword, on the other hand, I'm proficient with medium armor and does anything. We already have that athletics and intimidation, though. That could be of value. <sighs> she a low life? No. Aristocrat, we already did. Academic, I think we already did. Acolyte, though. Lawkeeper. There we go. Lawkeeper. She's all about the law. Uh, yeah, let's do that. Uh, what kind of personality she got? Uh, Lawkeeper. She is all about lawfulness. And she is all about violent. No. She's lawful evil. Um, no. Uh, pragmatist authority. Let's do lawfulness authority. We can go crazy on that. There's lawfulness here. And. Pragmatism. I'm cool with that. So more lawful neutral, I'd say, than anything. Now again, point by. How do we do these ones? Well, again, strength is going to be important for her. We already knew that. Uh, let's get that to at least a 14. Dex at least to a 10. Come on. Get that shit fucking holy. Yeah, maybe 16 at least. From there, to give them some midland abilities here, see what kind of points we got left to spend. Six more. How about more strength? 15 is a solid one. Got kind of a solid dexterity at 15, 12, 16. I'm happy with that. Can I get that to 17 if I so choose? Oh, I hate stupid people. So, again, having an intelligence at 12 is not the worst thing ever. Again, just because you're fired doesn't mean you're dumb as a box of rocks. She could be Chris Mack, though. We could do, say, maybe some intimidation checks. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, notice this one the select fighting style. This is some serious fun here. So, it's two weapon fighting, great weapon fighting, you know, big two handed weapon kind of shit. So, Two weapon versus two handed. Be real clear on the difference here. Dueling. It's pretty fun for some solid damage. Defense. Uh, just some generic plus one to your armor class, which is nothing to scoff at. Archery, again, if you want to keep as a ranged fighter. Protection is the one that I like, and uh, that is his last time, and I want to explain why. So within five feet of you, if you have a teammate, you can expend your reaction, uh, which, again, is something that you don't usually use in my builds anyway, um, to impose disadvantage on an attack roll to somebody that is on your team that's being uh, smited or attacked. Uh, so again, if you're close enough, you're basically protecting the wizard, you're protecting the other paladin, you know, whatever. You're uh, side by side with someone as long as you got that fucking shield, which of course you're just going to sort and board it, so you can actually help protect you. That disadvantage is bigger than you think. Remember, they roll twice, they take the worst of the two. Uh, for our skills, you know, she has class skills and she has background language and that's all she gets. So she's not good at much of anything, but she's really good at con. Notice that plus seven, that's fucking this monster. Part of that's because of the snow dwarf endurance. So a really nice con saves. Decent strength saves even at the 15 right now. We'll get that up to 16, that'll be even better. Um, intimidation's already there, that's nice. Perception's already there, that's nice. And that's it, so we only got two to pick from. We don't really need athletics. Acrobatics and history, and she's not very smart, so I thought we're insight and survival. Maybe she's our survivalist. So I'll happily take that, I suppose. And then for our last one, it's really athletics or acrobatics. I might as well go athletics. Fuck it. She has Smith's tools, so she has proficiency in the, the ability to craft and trade uh, with her uh, smithy ability. 
Uh, she has, of course, the proficiency on the cool things that fighters would have proficiency in. She's a dwarf, so as such, dwarvish language and common language are free. We only get one more to pick from. Uh, we don't have to go elvish. We don't have to go halfling. Maybe she doesn't like those teammates. Uh, but she might be interested in orcs because uh, all dwarves seem to hate orcs. Sounds good. What's she going to look like? Uh, and she was um, Spell of the Family Blade, right? My Spell Blade. All right. Uh, faces. Typical Dwarven face. Got the angry nun look. That one's all right. Uh, hair shape. Oh, for a dwarf, what color hair we're gonna give her? Well, of course, she should be probably tanner than that, right? Yeah, that's a little more tanner. I was kind of hoping for. Uh, what kind of color hair would a dwarf have? Black to me. Hmm. Hair shape. She's a fighter, so she would want some no nonsense. Shit. Maybe she's butch and she goes with the fucking uh, buzz cut. It's a little too much. That, on the other hand, I can see. Business in the front, party in the back. Oh, yeah. I'm cool with that. Eye color. She's a dwarf, so she's probably got dark eyes as well. I'm cool with that. She's a little older than most, but not that old that you'd really start to notice it too much. Cool with that. Okay, so now. Uh, so we want to select people. So we want to select you. We want to select... Devotee. We want to select our spell blade. We want to select our shadow caster. And with that, we're starting the game. Woo woo! So this here is just to show you um, the darkness and lightness and contrast. If you can make out this symbol very briefly, I can. Or barely, I can. And same with up here. That's all we really care for. So zero and zero is working for me. And that is because there's so much impact of the light and the dark in this game. So let's get into it. <laughs> 